Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Boudreau. I'm Manimit's Donor Relations Manager. Thank you so much for joining us for today's special presentation, A Conversation with Our Future, Sustainability and the Next Generation. We've got a fantastic program for you today. And in just a moment, I'm going to turn it over to Laura Babb, who leads Manimit's U360 Business Sustainability Internship Program. Laura will be moderating today's panel discussion. But I do want to highlight just a few things for you before we begin. There are a couple of ways that you can ask our panelists questions today. At the bottom of your screen in your toolbar, you should see a box marked participants. If you don't see that toolbar, just use your mouse pointer to hover over the bottom of the screen and it should appear. And if you have a question, just click the participants icon and in the box that opens up down at the bottom is an option to raise hands. Just click on that and Laura will call on you for your question. Uh, the second way to ask a question today is through the icon marked Q&A. That's located also in the bottom toolbar. So just click that icon, type your question, and we'll ask the panelists for you. Uh, lastly, if you're unable to stay today for the entirety of the presentation, we are recording it and we'll share a link with you in a follow-up email so you can watch it on demand or share it with others. So again, thank you so much for joining us. And now I'd like to turn it over to Laura Babb. All right, thank you, Chris. And thank you all for joining us today for this special roundtable discussion with the next generation. As the program manager for our U360 Business Sustainability Internship Program, I've had the pleasure of spending the last eight months working with the exceptional college students on our panel today. But before I, I introduce them to you and we start hearing their perspective on sustainability, I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you more about U360 and exactly what they've done with us at Manomet this year. At Manomet, we believe that to solve the complex environmental, social, and economic challenges we face, the next generation must be actively engaged and trained to make our world more sustainable. They are the largest generation in history and known as the climate change generation, they will be disproportionately impacted by today's global challenges. One primary way college students can be part of the solution is through their future careers and workplaces. And students from all disciplines, not just environmental majors, must be prepared to tackle today's urgent sustainability issues. We need increased participation from young people with diverse backgrounds who have the ability to create sustainability solutions that they can bring to any job or industry. However, college students often lack the real world understanding of practical sustainability, as well as the soft skills employers most seek and are needed to be effective change makers. They need to know how to work with people who think differently from them and how to create practical solutions. And they must possess the professional and interpersonal skills necessary to engage others in problem solving. These things cannot be learned through coursework alone. As such, U360 is designed to give college students experience in three areas that are vital to solving today's complex sustainability challenges and that are not taught in the classroom. The first is career skills, specifically the ones employers most seek, like professionalism, teamwork, communication skills, creative problem solving, and a strong work ethic. The second is an understanding of practical applied business sustainability. Students leave U360 equipped with an extensive real world understanding of both business management and how sustainability practices can help a company make money, save money, and reduce risks, in addition to being good for the planet and society. And third is the ability to work with people who think differently from them. Solving complex challenges like climate change requires bringing people to the table with different viewpoints, knowledge, and experience. And U3, U360 teaches college students how to do just that. U360 is a two semester experiential education and professional development program. The curriculum begins with six weeks of educational workshops and skills trainings focused on business sustainability principles, professional communication, time and project management, interview skills, and professional ethics. For the next 20 weeks, each student reaches out to approximately 200 small and medium-sized businesses of their choosing to request an interview about their current practices. Each student then interviews up to 30 of those businesses and administers Manomet's Small Business Sustainability Assessment of their environmental, social, and governance practices. In the fall, they interview a variety of business types, and in the spring, each student chooses one industry to focus on. 
After every interview, the business data is analyzed and I follow up with the businesses to give them their sustainability scores and access to our online toolkit that they can use to improve their practices. And a significant percentage say it's likely they'll make changes to their practices just as a result of that interview. The 6 million small businesses in this country have a large collective environmental footprint, but are often overlooked and underserved when it comes to sustainability efforts. With time, financial, and resource constraints, small businesses have many barriers that can make it challenging to prioritize sustainability. U360 gives them the opportunity to evaluate their overall sustainability, main, many for the first time, while gaining tools to help them increase the overall health of their business. And for our students, it's this direct engagement with business owners that provides them with the majority of their experiential education and professional development in U360. And then during the last three weeks of the program, each student creates a sustainability action plan for one business they interviewed with customized, highly researched, feasible recommendations for how the business could improve its sustainability practices. And finally, the students all present their action plans to a panel of judges at our annual capstone competition, where winners are selected and scholarship prizes are awarded. And that will be coming up later in the summer, so stay tuned for more information about that event. Since piloting U360 in January of 2016, with just three students from the University of Southern Maine, the program has grown and expanded substantially. Over the past four years, 84 students have participated in the program from 14 universities in all four New England states. And these students have engaged 952 small businesses from all 50 states. And we hit that 50 state milestone this year, which we were very excited about. And we're also very proud that U360 is helping to foster women business leaders as over 75% of the students who have participated in the program are female. This year, 14 students enrolled from 10 universities in New England. Over the past two semesters, 228 small businesses from 42 states had conversations with our students about their current sustainability. The businesses ranged in size from one to 1400 employees and represented countless different types and industries. Again, the purpose of U360 is to train and prepare the next generation to tackle the complex challenges that will most impact their futures. As such, the program is focused on, entirely on giving college students the real world experience and the personal and professional development they need to be effective change makers. Our, our U360 students learn firsthand how dozens of small businesses operate, they gain vital career skills and meaningful work experience. They see how the principles they're learning in school are applied in the real world, and they develop the tools necessary to create a more sustainable world. Most importantly, they learn how to have hard conversations with people who think differently from them, find common ground, and create solutions that make the world a better place. I should mention that U360 is and always has been an entirely virtual program, so we've been together in Zoom all year, and our work with the students wasn't dis disrupted by the coronavirus. But as you can imagine, COVID-19 definitely impacted the last few weeks of their outreach and interviews with the small businesses. And the rest of their semester was deeply affected as all of their colleges closed and switched to online learning in mid-March. So we're really excited for the opportunity to spotlight these students today and hear about their experiences and perspectives. And... I'm now pleased to introduce this year's class of U360 interns here at Manomet and begin our roundtable discussion with the next generation. I'll be getting the conversation started with a couple of initial questions for our students, and then we'll be opening it up for questions from you, our audience. Feel free to ask about their experience in U360 this year, their perspective on the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and what it means for their future, what it's like growing up under the threat of climate change, what they've learned from conversations with hundreds of small businesses, and just anything else you'd like to know about how their generation views the world today. And now for the introductions. So to begin with, we have Alex Wise, a senior at the University of Vermont. We have Amanda Sear, a junior at the University of New Hampshire. Autumn Strom, a junior at University of Vermont. Catherine Slayton, a sophomore at University of New Hampshire. Crystal Pittman, a second year student at University of Maine. Eleanor Silver, a senior at Colby College. Emily Hotham, a senior at University of Southern Maine. 
Emma Chen, a sophomore at Mount Holyoke College. Catherine Berry, a senior at Colby College. Mallory Strain, a junior at Suffolk University. Mark Dagelli, a junior at Wheaton College. Prakash Garg, an MBA student at Clark University. And Tom Doloff, a senior at University of Southern Maine. All right, you all can, all the students can unmute yourselves and we'll get the conversation started. So my first question for each of you to answer, just to give everybody a better sense of what you've been doing all year and the types of businesses you've been talking, talking to. Um, I'm curious if you could share what industry you focused on during the spring semester and what are a few types of businesses you interviewed this year? I focused on art industry and I interviewed art shipping companies, theater companies, art museums, architectural firms, and graphic design firms. Um, I focused on the wedding industry, so I um, researched breweries, wineries, hotels, uh, jewelries, and uh, limo business, etc. I did the uh, recreation industry and I focused on outdoor recreation, indoor recreation, uh, like white, white water rafting, uh, and some manufacturers as well. I did, uh, I chose a uh, food and agriculture industry and I interviewed farms, brewery, nonprofit farms, grocery stores, organic stores, and many more. Thank you. Yes, I, I interviewed industries related to disability. And so I got to interview um, medical tech firms, law offices, um, case management, agencies um, and disability dog training places and more. <laughs> I interviewed businesses related to animals. So I got to interview veterinary offices, conservation organizations and um, shelters. For my industry, I did the building and construction. So these were businesses such as uh, painting, carpentry, etc. I chose to interview businesses in the food system and interviewed breweries, restaurants, small grocers, farms, nonprofits, and many more. My focus is on the entertainment industry. So I interviewed businesses relating to theater, opera, gaming studios, as well as uh, radio stations. For my industry, I also picked building and construction and I got to interview a bunch of architecture and engineering firms, along with a lot of landscape companies. My focus was the sports industry, and some businesses that I interviewed were surfing camps, bowling alleys, uh, rock climbing gyms, um, sports retail shops. I focused on the wedding industry, and I interviewed businesses such as florists, catering companies, bakeries, and transportation. I focused on the travel and tourism industry, so I researched and interviewed hotels, travel magazines, restaurants, and travel planners. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. So my second question for you that anyone can answer, you know, however, however many of you feel inspired to share your thoughts on this, what are the reasons that you personally want to create a more sustainable world? Um, for me personally, it was, uh, I, I was particularly interested in that aspect of learning how to um, in this internship just because I had never really thought about it before college, but afterwards I realized like the type of lifestyle that I was living, there's so many more things that I could do personally to increase the sustainability of the world. So it was more like a personal, uh, a personal choice to kind of better the way I was going about things. For me, it's been um, related to um, health and wellness um, for my children and for myself. I'm a non-trans, so I have some kids that, um, that you know, I want to see them have a bright future. I witnessed my uh, grandma's on countryside the river just in three years is changing from a river to a, a trash dump of 
near nearby factories. So I really I'm really curious about how does that happen and what we can actually do and what what are the difficulties of preventing them being responsible for the things that they generated. Anyone else want to share their thoughts? Uh, you I, to say something, um, I personally think it's just practicality. I would like to see a future that's worth living in. Um, if we don't choose to be more innovative and thoughtful in decision-making processes, especially in business, uh, we're going to suffer the consequences. So it's more of a necessity as opposed to an option. Mm -hmm. yeah, and um, Similarly, I like the planet that we live on, and I think a lot of people like where we live and want to preserve it. And um, I think that humans like solving challenges and climate change is a really huge challenge, but um, together we can solve it. And 360 is one small part of um, showing us how we can change the world through actions and through small businesses. That's great. All right, so at this point, I will turn it over to audience members. So as Chris said, uh, if you click on the participant box, there's a button to click raise hand if you have a question and uh, we'll unmute you and you can ask your question or you can type it if you'd rather uh, we read the question for you, you can type your question in the Q&A box. Um, so yeah, and and I have some other questions for the students too if, if you know, we want to ask any of those. Um, let's see. All right, well, while we're letting people warm up, I will ask you just in general, what would you say uh, the skills, what, what skills do you feel that you most developed during your time in U360 this year? I think the professional development was um, one of the major improvements that I know myself, I'm, I'm sure everyone else uh, made just because that fall semester, the, the workshops that we did, I think the changes that we had made are just going to better ourselves so much more for the future. So. I feel like confidence wise, I've improved a lot with um, speaking. I learned a lot about time management because we need to track um, the business we contact. So um, having a structure in our time, it, during despite our school work is very important to keep up with the business contacts. I think I also learned how to apply sustainability to a ton of different aspects of the world too. Um, as an, Go ahead Prakash. As an international student I learned a lot like the new culture like the uh, how, what kind of culture the market is following out here. Uh, that was very important to me and uh, obviously the communication skills. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. So Lauren, we, we've got a couple of uh, questions coming in. Uh, Karen great. asks, what specifically do you plan to do when you're out of college to help the environment? Oh, that's a great question. Um, being a community and international development major, I wanted to do, um, I knew I always wanted to work with a nonprofit after I graduated college, but after doing this program and working with Manament, which is an environmental nonprofit itself, it really opened up the field of environmental nonprofits. And I realized that even though I am not a hard science student, I would still have many things to contribute and learn from working from an environmental nonprofit. Great. I'd like to um, eventually go into environmental law. We actually have uh, five students who are heading out into the world imminently that are graduating this semester. So I'm particularly curious uh, what some of you plan on doing to address that question that was asked. Well, I'll be going back to school eventually to get my master's in architecture. So I hope to create sustainable net zero buildings. Okay. As far as I think that this is just a beginning for, for the sustainable world, 
and uh, I am a business major and I'll be graduating in December. So my focus will be on sustainable businesses only. Thank you. After graduating, I'd love to work with local farms um, and consumers to help connect people with their local food system and make distribution easier and have uh, healthy and fresh and sustainably made food more accessible to everybody. Um, I'm also a business student, so I see myself working in fields uh, for for-profit business that are sort of benefiting environmental practices. So that could be either B corporations that have environmental focus or just personally being a stronger advocate for environmental sustainability. Um, in anything I do, as well as just how I relate to people in the business world. Yeah, going off that, um, I'm an economics and business management major as well. Um, and I was unfamiliar with the environmental sustainability before this internship, and it was kind of a field that I wanted to learn more about. And similar to Tom, I kind of just wanted to learn to see how I can contribute within my major to something outside of it. That's great. Looks like, yeah, it looks like we have a lot of questions coming in in the Q&A. Chris, what, what's the next one we have? Hi, Laura. So Molly asked, what was your hardest challenge? For me, the hardest challenge was um, initially gaining the confidence to interact with the businesses, but uh, I quickly learned that humility and confidence kind of go hand in hand. So through getting to talk, talking to multiple businesses, I kind of learned, um, you know, that not to be as nervous about those situations, but that was definitely the hardest feat uh, originally starting out. For me, I think the hardest part was not feeling like a burden and that talking about sustainability is actually something that's really helpful for everyone. Yeah, that's a good one. My challenges were calling, you know, 20 or 30 businesses in a day <laughs> to try to outreach. That was a challenge. I think one of the challenges was kind of like finding new ways to contact businesses that you haven't already um, like heard from already, just because the first, your first point of contact, you got some, and then your second point, you got more. But after that second point, it was kind of just like scrambling to figure out ways to communicate and get into contact with them and not having like much outreach experience. That was pretty, that was like a challenge to overcome. Yes, that's part of that creative problem solving that we talk about in U360 and, and everybody develops some really creative ways of, of trying to reach businesses and got tons of interviews. It was 230, which is amazing. Um, to follow up on that, um, I think being pleasantly persistent uh, was something that was definitely a challenge at some points, um, both being persistent and being pleasant while doing so. Um, so some businesses, we just would never get back to you. That's just the nature of outreach. But I think some that did get back to you that were apprehensive, it, you had to sort of put on that big smiley face and really introduce them to why you're doing it and that it's a legitimate program. I had a lot of people who, like when I did get in contact with them, they thought I was a robocaller or something like that. So people are pretty apprehensive to outreach and just trying to be very legitimate and uh, humble when, when you're reaching out to them. That's great. Yes. Um, something that was challenging for me is getting used to being the interviewer and not being interviewed and having to control the conversation and decide where it goes. Follow up on that, uh, I felt like being natural and myself during the interview is, uh, is was a challenge at first um, because sometimes if I only ask the questions that's uh, prescribed by the interview, um, the business owners will only answer the question directly without telling me more uh, why it is a case and, or some background information about that question. So um, be getting comfortable during interview and knowing how to control and push the conversation forward is a learning experience and also a challenge. Great, thank you all for that. Laura, the next question we have comes from Richard who asks, what is the most important thing you think a business can do right now to help solve issues related to climate change? Um, I 
I don't think that there's one answer to that question, um, especially because there are so many different aspects of sustainability. Um, so I think my answer would to just be aware of the problem and be aware of the solutions that are available. And I think that that is the best way for business owners to move forward is to just know that they have a role to play and that there are ways that they can increase their own sustainability and to explore the different options. Mm. I, I agree think, with that. Oh, <laughs> you can go, Adam. I think that the most important way to address um, the climate change crisis would be using the technology that we have to create simpler and more efficient systems. Even now, just having this over Zoom shows that so many different things that we had previously thought were only possible in person are possible using technology and the internet. So I think um, wherever possible, applying even uh, things such as paperless invoicing or um, doing anything you can without using physical resources and using technology is a really big advantage that our generation has over previous generations. Mm -hmm. Catherine, I agree. Yeah, so mine's kind of similar. I was going to say that, again, there isn't one thing that would encompass every single business, but one thing that I think would encompass most business is just reducing overall consumption. I think that's one way that almost any business or any person has the ability to reduce their carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so thank you for your question, Professor. Um, so I think the way I would look at it would be to evaluate your impact. So we have that basis metric. So you can compare it to, to for progression. Um, that being said, that doesn't mean it's always feasible to do it on in an in-depth basis. But say if you're you know, if you're checking how much trash you're producing per month, you could then look to see how your reduction strategies could be to make a reasonable impact. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I would like to supplement on your idea that collecting data, how much a business is using, how much the business is utilizing, and what is the waste they are producing. If they, if they can track that, that data, they can uh, be more sustainable. That's great. I, I just want to chime in, too, that this is what they'll be talking about at the capstone coming up later in the summer, where they'll be talking about specific things that their businesses that they have chosen can do to address climate change and other facets of sustainability. So yeah, so stay tuned for that. Chris, I think we have some more questions. We do, Laura. So Dan asks, what most surprised you about your chosen industry, both good and bad, in terms of sustainability? I think one thing that was very surprising in the recreation industry was the variety of um, kind of openness to being sustainable. Like I would talk to uh, manufacturers and a lot of them would be relatively negative towards the idea of sustainability just because their main concern was maximizing um, like cost efficiency. So they wanted to be really cost efficient and sustainability isn't always, um, which was one of the points that I was trying to combat with the recreation industry. But then I would see an outdoor recreation, for example, with whitewater rafting. Um, a lot of the companies and businesses that I interviewed were extremely sustainable just because they were already in an outdoor setting. So it was almost easier for them to be more sustainable. And they just loved like the advantage they got from advertising that. So. One thing that you can go ahead. Uh, one thing that surprised me was just how state level regulations and services can affect sustainability. So I interviewed uh, businesses in states that just had no recycling program at all, so they couldn't recycle and were really um, got low sustainability scores in that aspect. Um, so just the importance of those services being available. Hey, Autumn. Um, I think one thing that surprised me about the wedding industry was I had always known it was inherently wasteful, but after interviewing several different, for example, florists across the country, um, really consumer demand dro drove how much sustainability the company was striving for, especially in places like the, uh, the Northeast or the Pacific Northwest, where they had um, more emphasis on sustainability programs. And I think that 
this was a really good example of how consumers can really drive sustainability in the future. Mm -hmm. um, I also did the wedding industry and I totally agree with Autumn. I think that the wedding industry, I had never really thought of as its own industry before until I chose it. And then as soon as I started looking into and really just thinking about what it takes to put on kind of a big wedding or what usually is involved in putting on a big wedding, there's single use and there's a lot of travel and there's a lot of just kind of wasteful practices involved in weddings. And it doesn't necessarily need to be that way. Um, but that's kind of just like what Autumn said, um, that's kind of how it's evolved to be. But similarly, it can also evolve to be a very sustainable um, business as well, or a sustainable industry as well. So, Great. Any Laura, other? Oh, go ahead, Chris. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I was going to say the next question we have comes from Jenny, who asked, are any, of, are any of you considering work in the fields that you studied for this program? I wouldn't say no, but it's kind of a difficult thing to decide at this point, just because I have a sort of broad deg degree and I picked a broad industry, so it's very possible. And I would definitely be interested in doing something along the lines of entertainment, but uh, it just depends on how I could fit in there somehow. I know a couple of, I know there's a couple food systems, a couple building and construction, that that's why you picked what you did. Do you have any thoughts about that, any of you? So I chose, go ahead, Catherine. <laughs> I chose the food system and originally it was kind of to kill two birds with one stone to look at small businesses that I wanted to potentially work at. I was looking at a lot of businesses out west because I was looking to move to Denver. So I think after learning about the operations of small grocers or farms, and I had a really interesting, inspiring interview with an aquaculture uh, small business, I think those would all be very cool industries and businesses to go into. So I, it made me very excited to graduate and potentially go in those fields. Great. Yes, I, I interviewed um, um, adv advocates for disability, um, and I, I would think that I would be interested in that, um, but I'm hopeful to do advocacy for the environment, so it was a little bit different. That's great. And Emily, you were going to say something when Catherine started. Yeah, I, so I chose the building and construction industry and I'm an environmental science major and my decision in doing that was because I'm also interested in um, sustainable architecture and green design. So through the work with a lot of the businesses um, that go into building a home, I learned a lot more about how to make those specific aspects of the industry more sustainable. So that's definitely something I'm interested in um, as I go forward. Great. Laura, we've got another question from Karen who asks, were you surprised at some of the positive environmental changes that are occurring due to the coronavirus? Hmm. I wouldn't say I'm surprised necessarily, but I'm definitely glad that it's happening. It just kind of goes to show that it's in our hands and it's, it is up to us. This is like cleaning up the environment is something we are capable of doing if we reduce what we use. This, uh, this is a great question and thank you for the question. Yeah, uh, I, I completely agree with Catherine that we should not be waiting for this, this event. We, we might be doing that earlier. Mm -hmm. Something that I'm hoping is that this kind of illuminates the fact that people really do care about natural spaces because now everyone's suddenly flocking to parks because they don't have anything else to do and want to get outside. Um, and how there's in some places a really low number of those natural spaces to go to and they're really crowded and how those are just worth preserving. 
Mm -hmm. I was surprised at how how quickly it seemed like the skies in some places cleared up and people are, um, you know, on social media saying, oh, look how, you know, I can, it's a blue sky or, you know, I can see, I can see the fish in this water, you know, and before it maybe they couldn't see a blue sky or they had a cloud, a cloudy water. So mm -hmm. it's just goes to show how much we impact our planet. Yeah, we definitely talked about that in our team meetings because Emma is from China and Prakash is from India and so many of the images that we've been seeing of the then and now of the pollution were in those countries and it just changed so quickly. So that that is a that is a great question. Uh, we have another question in the chat that's similar along uh, the lines of COVID-19. So Danielle asks, with small businesses being deeply impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, what are some things people can do to support the businesses in their communities right now? Um, I think that um, buying gift cards is a really good way to support small businesses and you can give those gift cards um, to other people so they can use them in the future such as for restaurants or businesses like that um, or you can buy a gift card and use it um, in the future yourself so I think that's a good um, way to support small businesses. The idea of giving them upfront capital right now and then, yeah. no, that's great. I think one of the uh, smaller things that everyone can do is um, is kind of just like showing appreciation and respect for all the employees that have to go into work just because they're going through it too. And a lot of them don't necessarily have like want to be there just because of the uncertainty and uh, unsafe environment. However, if you show respect and appreciation, I think that overall improves like the, uh, I guess, the happiness of the employee and overall workspace. I felt for the grocery, um, uh, we might just go to the local farms and local uh, small business to buy our grocery instead of going to the large uh, chain like Walmart to support the local food business. Mm -hmm. to, to that point, I was just going to say, I think um, just conscious buying and purchasing rather than buying online, shop at local stores just to help those small businesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if you diversify where you're spending your money as much as possible and try to spend your money at as many local businesses as you can. And then also maybe use social media. If you do go and get a coffee or a sandwich from a little place down the street, put it on social media and mm -hmm. show people that they're still open and that they're making adjustments. I think that just kind of showing your support will entice others to show their support as well. Mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah. Chris, it looks like we have some others in the Q&A. We do. Uh, Susie asks, how will this internship benefit you as a lifelong learner? Ooh. Well, my emails are going to be significantly better going forward. <laughs> um, I think that's probably one of the one of the very specific but key uh, learnings I've gained from this internship was before my emails were always very curt and to the point, but they kind of lack that human element that makes them more personable and effective. So that going forward, I think is going to be effective in me communicating with others in the future. Yes, you definitely need communication and social skills, you know, going, you know, into any field so it's definitely gonna build on you know what I, what I had and then I'll have more opportunities. So. I think that a really key part about being a lifelong learner is being open to new experiences and one amazing part about U360 was that we weren't confined to a specific state or region for our interviews and I feel that because we were able to interview different types of businesses in different regions of the country that may not have the same values or ideas that I have was really inspiring to see how similar people are across the country, even though they may have really different ideas about sustainability. So I think that the best part about this for me was becoming really open-minded and able to see connections, even though some business owners and I um, may not have a lot of the same things in common. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most important things was that um, at the beginning, you find out quickly that you get out what you put in. 
And if you put in a lot of effort right up front, you can, you almost can schedule like three to four interviews per week. And if you kind of put it on the back burner for the week, then you may get zero or one. But if you really put in the effort, you actually get a lot out. Mm -hmm. Certainly this internship helped me to help me in boosting my abilities in unlimited number of uh, abilities. But the most important thing that this internship gave me was, was, was the glasses to see the businesses in prospect of environment, just not for the monetary profits. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Laura, Amy asks, did you notice any trends that maybe surprised you among the businesses that you interviewed? Um, I think that a couple of other people have touched on uh, how region and what part of the country you're in really makes a difference. And I've noticed that in certain states, there is a significant interest in sustainability and sustainable practices, um, whereas other parts of the country maybe don't have the resources, they don't have the systems in place um, to make sustainable practices more easy or more accessible. So I felt like that was a really significant difference across the country. In the business I, I interviewed, I found a general trend of people realizing uh, being sustainable act can actually save them money and uh, be more effective in their business practices. So, Were there any trends? Oh, sorry, Tom, go ahead. Uh, I was actually going to say that I saw kind of a, a lack of trends, um, which I guess could be a trend in itself, was that different businesses, they their perceptions of sustainability varied greatly. So like one business could be doing you know, next to nothing on a topic relating to sustainability, like they'll check their electricity bill and they say, like, oh, we're doing great at energy management, whereas another could you know, be doing like very thorough evaluation of how they could minimize their uh, energy uh, consumption, and yet they both rate themselves at the same place. So I think that sort of variability is a key part to how businesses are evaluating their sustainability. Yes, I agree with Tom, it's all about perspective. <laughs> well, and I was gonna ask, um, because you looked at the environmental, social, and governance, practices of the businesses? Did you notice any trends in some of the other areas of sustainability, like social sustainability or their governance practices? Or the you businesses that through. <laughs> For the businesses I interviewed in the building and construction industry, a common trend was workforce challenges. So uh, just maintaining their employees year after year, which obviously can put them at a competitive disadvantage, um, regardless of where they're located. Mm-hmm. Catherine, were you going to say something at the same time? Was that you? Yes, I noticed through all the businesses that I interviewed, not just in the food system, but ones that I also interviewed in the beginning of the semester, all were very involved in their local community and were either good or excellent at donating goods or organizing fundraisers. And I think that speaks to how small businesses have a power in certain communities and small businesses are the backbone of everyday life. Mm -hmm. I think one of the uh, one of the other trends that I noticed was that early on um, in in not a majority but some of the interviews, um, a lot of the business owners thought that only the only thing contributing to sustainability was the environmental aspect and not even the social or governance aspect. So like I would bring up the social or governance section and explain what it was going to be, and the common response was, "Oh, that counts in, in sustainability as well." And it was kind of just like that mentality amongst business owners that it was also like a learning experience for them too. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I should add that when the students create their list of businesses, uh, the requirement is that no more than like 5% can be strong sustainability leaders. So really trying to reach businesses that have not yet started this journey or this process and may not even know what the triple bottom line is, which is the environmental, social and uh, governance practices of sustainability. So that's a great point, Mark. Chris, all right, we have more questions. We do, we've got a couple of questions that actually pair together nicely. Uh, okay. Molly asks, what does sustainability mean? And Merrill asks, did your definition of sustainability change as a result of this experience? And if so, how? Excellent, I was gonna spring that one on them too, so. So for me, I'm an environmental science major, so 
immediately when I hear sustainability, I typically just think of the environmental sustainability. And I've heard, I had heard of the other aspects before, but it wasn't necessarily in my definition at the beginning of this year. Um, I wasn't sure if it's just because I didn't know about it as much. Um, but now it's definitely the social and governance parts are definitely in my definition and Uh, so uh, I, I actually go to school for sustainable business management. So my, while my perception of it hasn't changed dramatically, I think the specificity of it has changed quite a bit. So I see sustainability as sort of like there's three circles and there's a smaller circle inside of each circle. So a business, uh, so like that's your financial circle exists in a society. So that's the second largest circle and that society exists in an environment. Um, and sustainability has to address all three for the longevity of the business, AKA it's sustainability. Um, and going from that, it's just, it's very interesting to look at just how, how a business can inspire its own longevity while also contribute to those larger factors. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's an excellent point. So um, I would say that sustainability um, before this, and I still kind of think this, but it's the ability to stand the test of time. Um, and on top of that, within the realm of sustainability, there's environmental, social, and governance, which we're all very familiar with now. Um, but I study economics and math, um, and I'm I've always been interested in environmental sustainability and then because the kind of my degree, um, the kind of prism through which I learn is economics um, and math. I think about profits and I think about numbers, but I didn't really consider the social uh, impact of that, that social aspect of sustainability before I entered the internship. And I didn't realize how, um, how much of an impact it has on a business's strengths because I did notice a trend in businesses that focus on social sustainability and social like supporting their employees and supporting their community there really is a massive impact on how well it reflects on the business. Mm -hmm. That's great. Laura we've got a question from Louise who asks you came to this training in college. Is there a way to help even younger people learn what you're learning about sustainability and about changing minds? Hmm. Oh, that's great. I'd say social media, you know, helps. I think one of the important things is kind of like educating your own network and kind of the smaller circle that you like hang out around like, in my own life I'm constantly educating like my little brother and obviously before all this coronavirus like when his friends were over we'd be they'd be asking me like what I was up to and I'd be explaining what I was learning throughout that and then hope like trusting that they would break that down into like their own network and kind of have it be like a chain of events to make a change I guess. I think that I agree with Mark and going off with Mark said, it's even important for even younger kids to not so much educate them, but get them into um, the environment and have them get their own appreciation and um, respect for the world we live in. I think a lot of us came into this program because we do care so deeply about the environment. And a lot of that came from earlier on in life, in some ways, um, getting like a close tie to the natural earth. To that point, I think, too, just the fact that my family, since I was young, has um, made the environment an important part of the conversation. I think just keeping that topic of discussion in, um, in schools with younger kids could also um, pique their interest into sustainability. I think uh, being proactive about their own education, not just the education in the school, uh, is pretty much uh, important because in my research process, I found a lot of nonprofits. They have very, there. They have so many free workshops that are offered offered to youth or young generation. Um, like um, people may not be know of. Like the young generation can 
uh, be proactive about what resources they can take advantage of in their town or in their city and um, educate themselves using these resources. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because looking at my own experience in my high school, um, within the four years that I was there, there was only one environmental class option in my all of my four years. So I think making those resources accessible to younger kids and those opportunities similar to this um, accessible to high school and younger, um, obviously not as intense, but making that available and this information um, like out there would be very beneficial. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That was a great question. Laura, our, our next question is from Jenny and she asks, have you had to change any of your recommendations due to COVID-19? Yeah, so for me, uh, my one, a lot of my recommendations are actually going to revolve around what's going on um, with coronavirus because it is impacting imp um, small businesses a lot, especially non-essential businesses. And so they're losing a lot of business. So I think it's important to make our recommendations for a capstone to address that so that they can continue operating sustainably at the baseline at least. And Catherine is doing a motel for her in the Southwest for her capstone. So, mm -hmm. uh, and you can, for those of you who are answering this question, you can, you can say the type of business that you're, they're also good yeah. about protecting the anonymity and confidentiality of the businesses. So I wanted to yeah. give that permission. So I'm doing a theater uh, in the Midwest. So they're not open. Um, because of COVID-19. So they're very heavily impacted as many small businesses are across the country. Um, so I have a couple recommendations in my capstone presentation that are addressing the COVID-19 crisis because of that. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, uh, oh, you can go. Go ahead. Um, so um, sorry. <laughs> I'm doing a, uh, a farm in New England. And I think, well, my big picture, my original big picture, uh, is going to be climate change but i think a lot of us for the most part are going to do a secondary big picture of coronavirus just because it is so prevalent now um and i think a lot of those recommendations might change leading up to it just because of the um i guess impact of the situation as now it seems to be kind of easing up um hopefully but i might be speaking just for myself i don't know <laughs> Autumn. I totally agree with Mark. I'm doing an assisted living facility in the Northeast, so I think that my business is one of the few that's still open as an essential business, and COVID-19 is my number one threat. So I think that I'll be monitoring um, my business really closely up until the capstone to see if they have done any changes related to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, I'm doing a brewery uh, in Wyoming and um, my business isn't open because of COVID-19 and actually when choosing my business because I did the wedding industry pretty much every business in the wedding industry is really really vulnerable to this crisis um, so my my action plan for my business it is designed to strengthen the overall foundation of the business so even though I haven't put anything specifically about COVID-19 in there yet, I'm hoping that my recommendations will strengthen the overall foundation of the business, which inherently protects against COVID-19 and its impacts. That's a great point, Mallory. I actually had a quick follow-up question for you all. Anyone who wants to answer is, uh, in light of coronavirus, you know, what do you see as the relationship between strong sustainability practices and resiliency? I feel like social sustainability really stands out um, because uh, when the business is not open, a lot of support comes from the community. And if the business have a very strong base uh, in the past, they're more likely to survive this crisis. Mm. I think that the stronger sustainability practices you have, um, the better off you are against like the risk of uncertainty of any situation, whether it be climate change or COVID-19, just because looking at it economically, 
Um, you're already reducing risk if you're having strong uh, sustainability practices, so that's beneficial in any situation. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, Chris, we have a couple of minutes left, and do we have more questions in the queue? We do. Uh, David asked, how do you think the U360 program could be improved? Ooh. <laughs> I think the way, the only way it could really be improved is um, I know you guys are working on trying to get out of New England. And although I know we have gotten interviews everywhere, I think, especially at the beginning, a lot of us focused on what we knew. So I think growing out to those other states and other schools could only benefit the program. Mm -hmm. I agree with Catherine. It's a really good program and... I think that would be the only way to improve it, just to expand it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, I think involving more people would uh, really help uh, help improving the program, and especially younger generation. Mm -hmm. I think if we could clone Laura, that would probably improve the, the program <laughs> a lot. Um, she has been the program manager, and she's working with all of us, so it's like a dozen different heads she has to count. Um, so if we were to expand the program, we would definitely need a, a duplicate of some sort <laughs> to make us as efficient. I think we have scientists on our staff. We can get yes. on that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Laura, we've got a question from Jenny who asked, how did you hear about the U360 program and did your school support you in participating? I went yes. to a career fair that's how I um, met Laura and found out about this program. I heard about it in one of my classes, but then a career counselor at my school also recommended it to me. So that's when I decided to apply. Mm -hmm. I found it on the website Handshake that our university student used to look for jobs. I also heard about it in class. I was in an environmental sociology class and some alumni um, students came in and talked about the program and that's how I got interested in it. I heard about U360 through the, uh, through the department head at USM for the environmental science program. USM is very um, connected with U360 and are um, advocates of the program, definitely. Hmm. Um, my story is a little peculiar compared to the rest. So I heard about U360 before I even started school at USM. Um, and then I also work at Whole Foods and Laura went through my line. I'm like, oh, I think I was going to apply to that program. She's like, oh, I, I'm the program manager. <laughs> I uh, wear my man in that jacket. <laughs> yes. So, so a lot of brand uh, representation there. Uh, and then also I was exposed to it multiple times in a couple different classes. That's great. And Laura, I think we have time for one more question, uh, which comes from Aaron, and he asks, what are the most noticeable differences between how large versus small companies approach sustainability? I would say that the big difference is that the large companies just have the resources to make financial investments that can make their business more sustainable in the long term, while small companies are more focused on individual employee or customer actions. And I think that, um, for, but also on the other hand, it may be more difficult with bureaucracy to have a large company implement sustainability processes faster, whereas a small business owner if they're only in charge of 15 people can make these decisions quickly and right away, even if they're not as um, large scale as a small, as a larger company. As far as I think that uh, it all depends on the, on the business owner, whether he is, uh, whether or she or he is a small business owner or a large business owner. Uh, uh, I've seen, uh, I have seen that I have done the research and I found that uh, uh, several small businesses are doing well in comparison to the large businesses in the community. So it's it's all it 
it's all dependent on the, the approach of the business owner, how he or she approaches to the sustainability. Um, I guess it, it kind of goes along with like the idea of like scale and procedures. Um, so larger scale businesses have a more laid out structure to address sustainability issues, whereas in smaller scale businesses, it's not really feasible to do something like that. So it's more informal. Um, so from there, it kind of, it's more of like, how do they want to represent their company uh, in terms of either like this big structured program or is it something they just do on the side um, at scale? I think that bigger businesses, they are able to take steps that are maybe more clearly measurable than smaller businesses. Like they're big businesses. Like I interviewed um, some hotels and a lot of hotels were looking into solar panels because they have the area for it and they have the kind of big business that sets them up for that. But then smaller businesses, like everybody was saying, a lot of what they do in regards to sustainability is kind of personal and person to person. Um, and they don't necessarily have as many mechanisms in place, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing less. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's also just taking into account bigger businesses have bigger impacts on the environment than the smaller businesses do. So um, bigger businesses, I think, often try to take into consideration the bigger fixes um, than small businesses might. But I, I don't really notice like a clear difference between small business owners and big business owners. It's more just like what do the businesses have at their disposal and what can they do given their resources. That's great. Well, that's a really good note to end on. I just want to, first of all, thank everybody who's attending and came and asked such great questions. But I also want to give a huge thanks to all of the students. I, I know you're all muted, but I hope you'll join me in applauding these amazing young change makers that I feel, I don't know about you, but I feel really good as they're about to head out into the world and uh, take over the reins. So thank you all so much for your thoughtful responses and and for everybody for being here. And, and Laura, I want to thank you and all the panelists that we had today. This was just really terrific. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for your time. And for everyone who joined us, thank you so much. I know many of you are, are donors and supporters of Manamet. I just want you to know how much we truly appreciate your support and how grateful we are. Uh, we've got a lot of virtual programming coming up in the next few weeks. So you can always visit our events page on our website, which is manamet.org slash events. That's manamit.org slash events uh, to see what's coming up next. And we hope that you're able to join us for a future webinar. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks, Chris. <laughs>